Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are going to give ourselves just a minute or so to let everyone trickling in um, to make sure everyone gets to hear the entirety of this fabulous program. And so if you are new to Sinsbury Library's virtual programming, my name is Lindsay Deffinger. I'm one of the adult services librarians. Tonight we have debut author Danielle Martin. She will be talking about her first novel, Glimmer As You Can. Um, if you do have questions or comments during her presentation, please use the chat feature. Uh, once she has done speaking, there will be plenty of time for Q&A. So if you don't like using the chat, hold on to them until the end, and we will make sure that we can get to all of those questions you may have. The book is available in our library system. It is on order for Simsbury, so it's not on our shelves just yet, but it has been ordered. You may also read it on Hoopla, which is a, uh, an ebook service that we have at the library. So you can read it on your phone or your tablet. If you don't want to come into the library, that is a possibility. And sorry, I'm trying to do about three different tabs right now. And sometimes I have difficulty multitasking. So I want to take a quick mini break for just a moment while I get us up on Facebook Live, and then I will do the true introduction and we'll get started. So just one moment, please. Hey, thank you for your patience. I appreciate it. And now, after welcome, um, so sorry, after graduating from New York University with a BFA in film, television, and English literature, Danielle Martin started her professional career as an assistant at the William Morris Agency before pursuing her master's degree in teaching. She has worked as an educator in New York, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana. She's currently, currently, she teaches a global population of students online in addition to homeschooling her own child. Glimmer As You Can is her first novel. And welcome to the stage, Danielle. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. So I am here to talk about my new book, Glimmer As You Can. And I know that some of us might have read the book Maybe some of us are interested in learning more about the book. And so I'm not going to give away any spoilers for those people who haven't read the book, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about my inspiration for the book. I'll do a few readings and then definitely feel free to put any questions in the chat as I go along and then also at the end. So. Okay, let's get started. I want to just set the scene. So Glimmer As You Can is a story that takes place primarily in 1962. And so before I started writing the book, I was very interested in this time period, this juncture between the more sort of staid and proper 1950s and the more crazy, wild, late 1960s. So I would frequently think about this period of time, wonder what it was like to be a young woman during that period of time. 
what did it feel like to be a woman trying to achieve a certain professional status during that time period? Or what kinds of professional and personal issues would women have to navigate during that time period? So all of these thoughts, questions were in my head before I started writing this book. Um, I also wanted to write about a place where women could get together, have a good time, and just be free. And that's really where the premise of my book came in, a women's social club. It's sort of an underground social club that the men in their lives weren't really supposed to know about. But this women's social club in Brooklyn Heights, where women could dance, read poetry, write poetry, do art, talk about intellectual ideas. And this is where our three main characters convene, meet up, along with an assorted cast of women of all different walks of life. And so the Starlight Social Club, which is the focal point of the book, is sort of this idealized place where there's only bonhomie, there's only friendship. And so any anytime there's a little bit of disagreement or an issue between women, the proprietor tries to quickly snuff it out. And so what we have here is basically like a, a golden place, a place where women can feel just free, happy, and at ease. So it's contrasted with the struggles of the era, right? At a time when it wasn't easy to be at ease as a, as a woman. And so the book takes place in different locations, but the primary location is Brooklyn Heights. So thus the virtual Brooklyn background. Ah, here we have the bridge, not the real bridge, the virtual bridge. And so if you can imagine in your mind's eye that the starlight is somewhere in this neighborhood and it's actually by day a dress shop. It's only by night that it turns into the social club. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about our three main characters. So we have women of different ages in this book who become friends. So the youngest woman is named Lisa and she is a Pan Am flight attendant, which at the time was considered to be an utterly glamorous position. You're a flight attendant and there's photos of flight attendants on billboards. Everybody's looking at the beautiful blue uniform. And basically it's like an honor at this period of time to be on the storied Pan Am flights. But I was interested in also, in addition to examining this lifestyle of glamour, I was interested in the maybe darker underbelly of what was it like to be a woman that faced all of these expectations. So how do you, deal with being yourself when you have the demands of the airline. You have to weigh a certain amount. You have to look a certain way. You have to be a certain way. You have to hide all of your emotions. You can't ever let that facade crack. You have to just embody the airline, right? So that's Lisa and she's 22 and she has a relationship in the background it's a difficult relationship, and that relationship filters in and out throughout the story in a lot of different ways. I'm not going to give away any spoilers about that, but needless to say, there's this sort of war in her own mind between this professional life and personal life. And so that's something that we see with all of the main characters in this book. It's this professional versus personal. And how do they smooth out the issues in both realms? 
to be all they could be. Right? And there we have glimmer as you can, like, how can you be your golden self when you're faced with these two parts of your life, neither of which might be easy? So I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit from the book. So this is a portion where Lisa is being controlled by the head flight attendant. And the head flight attendant was called the purser. So the purser in this book, Jane, is just basically like an arm of the corporate system trying to control Lisa. And so note that these people were not based off any particular people. These were all just figments of my imagination. But I'm going to go ahead and read Jane to you and read Lisa. And sort of we could think about really what might it have felt like to be a young flight attendant at this time. Again, with the idea that a lot of people might have been envious of that position. But what would it have really been like to be in this service position behind the scenes when you're expected to be just a certain way? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read from here. So Lisa has just gotten on the plane. Once on board the jet, Jane wasted no time putting Lisa to work on drink service. Cups in a line, just so. Napkins, perfectly flat. A pour with only subtle wrist action. No ungainly movements of the arms. As the purser, Jane was in control. Lisa set the fine glass row down in careful rows as the plane's motors roared to life. The engines were deafening with heavy blasts, but Jane's hisses were louder. You need to offer everyone blankets right after they board, remember? Quick, it's chilly. Yes, ma'am. Lisa scurried to grab a stack of blankets, trying to maintain their crisp folds. Care for a lap blanket? She pushed the edges of her lips upward as she glided down the aisle, smiling at each passenger. So there is one example of showing the facade that she would have to put on in her daily life as a flight attendant. So going back to when we're talking about the Starlight Social Club and how this is a place where women can just be free and basically let down the facade that might have been a requirement in other parts of their lives. So when Lisa first gets to the starlight, it's a moment when she's a little taken aback at first. So imagine at that time what it might have been like to drive around Brooklyn Heights late at night and suddenly stumble upon this room, this store, where everybody is so free when you're not used to that. What is that like? What is that I, w I don't want to say destruction of innocence because it's almost the opposite. It's like she's becoming aware of how it's possible to be free, how it's possible to not feel so burdened all the time. And that's what the starlight represents to her. And that's also what it represents to the other women. So I'm going to talk about the other main character. So another of the central characters is Elaine, who is a little bit older than Lisa. So she's in her late 20s with some more professional and personal experience under her belt. So Elaine is in a relationship with an alcoholic and they're engaged. He's basically, he has a lot of deep-seated issues and they worsened throughout the years as she was with him. So she didn't know at first. It was a case where somebody's with somebody and they don't realize at first what they're really like. And then throughout the years, they change. So I wanted to explore that idea in this book also of how could somebody get 
stuck in that situation, especially in that era in the early 60s. And what was that like for somebody who was suffering with alcoholism in terms of anybody who was a loved one trying to get them help, which would have been nearly impossible in that era when there was little in the way of resources, even fewer resources than there are now for people who are struggling. And so there's this entanglement where she is afraid to set him on edge. She's walking on eggshells with him. So if we think about what it must have been like for someone in that era who was in a relationship with somebody who was struggling with substance abuse or another kind of mental health issue with few resources at their disposal, the feeling of needing to be constantly delicate with everything they do and say, not rocking the boat. And so Elaine, though, is a very bright, intelligent woman who wants a career for herself, and she wants to work for New York's biggest newspaper, which is a fictionalized newspaper, but it's called The Chronicle. And so she wants to work for The Chronicle as a reporter, but, you know, there weren't many female reporters during this period of time. So she gets in the door or wants to get in the door as a fact checker, which was sort of an entry-level position that had wider access to women. But she does not want to tell her temperamental fiance about her job. What would happen if he's not working and she is? How does that set off the balance of power in their home? So I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit of this section where she's treading on eggshells with him because she has this secret she doesn't want to tell him she knows or doesn't know what he might do if she's admitting her truth okay so this is from chapter 13 of glimmer as you can oh actually sorry chapter 12 okay elaine paced her bedroom early in the morning she always had to be careful with Tommy. She waited as she made half loops around their bed. One wrong move might cut the spindle-thin fibers that held him in check. So this is the metaphor for how she feels like anything could at any minute just crack. So going back to this ideal of the starlight, the starlight social club where women could be free and we could consider what this means for Elaine, who's a woman who's struggling with her partner and not knowing what to do to help him, but she goes to the starlight and she can forget about that. And the women are just surrounding her with fun and intellectual freedom. And Elaine leads a poetry circle where she's writing about all sorts of elevated ideas. And she's writing about her feelings. And women are discussing everything. And it's her outlet. It's her outlet. So let's talk about the third central character of the book whose name is Madeline. So Madeline is the owner of the Starlight, and she is older than the other two characters. So Madeline is also in an entanglement. She's further released from her entanglements than the other two women in terms of she has an ex, but the ex is in a position of power as a Brooklyn city councilman. And so he still tries to control her, even though they're no longer married. 
And when they were married, he was definitely trying to control her, but it hasn't stopped, even though it's been a few years. So throughout the book, we have this feeling in the background of him trying to pull her strings in different ways. And that develops as the book goes further. Um, but Madeline has the outlet of the starlight, and that is where she can be free and where she also creates this safe haven for all of the women. And they always have theme nights, so they do what they can do to make it fun. And everything is a celebration. So I'm going to read a little bit from one of the Madeline chapters. So the book is in multiple points of view. Well, it's third person point of view, but we get the different characters. Each chapter is devoted to a different character. So I'm going to go ahead and read from a Madeline chapter. So this is where they're having a big bash. It's a big Valentine's Day bash for the girls. So this is sort of a symbolic passage where they're the women in attendance are almost crowning her as their goddess of the evening, right? Or basically as the presence in their lives that allows them to be themselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and read from this chapter. This is on page 40. Everyone was giddy at midnight. They laughed until salty tears flowed from their eyes into their drinks. They giggled into their cocktails and nearly snorted them backward in chokes and sputters. It didn't matter. Someone put Elvis back on and Madeline took out the roses she had bought for a couple of dollars on the avenue and stored in the back room all day. He passed the roses to the women who began to toss them on one of her mannequins and then someone made a sign for the mannequin's neck, Aphrodite. More and more women joined in. Soon, Aphrodite was transformed into a goddess in full bloom, strewn in an array of crimson petals. Madeline posed next to the mannequin, beckoning everyone onward, and the ladies took the cue to decorate her, too. She became their own goddess in full bloom, as the ladies sprinkled rose petals on her hair, gathering the petals back up from the ground in a chorus of laughter, then showering her in a floral cloud. So this is, this happens pretty early in the book, but it's one of her crowning moments and she gets to experience that satisfaction of having brought everyone together. So it was really fun writing this book and imagining how I could invent or make a place where women could feel completely liberated during that period of time. And it's been interesting talking to people now since the book's been published with the idea of the fact that even now, well, especially now with the pandemic situation that we're all in, but even before that, that there really are not that many places for women like that where be free or we could be free and gather together and just relax where it's not necessarily a formal sort of avenue where it's something that just happens a little more spontaneously so it's something if you read the book if you've read it if you're planning on reading it to sort of think about is oh, if I was going to make my own social club or if I was going to be at a sort of venue like this, what would I want to do? Who would I be? Like, would I be the person who gets out there in the middle of the dance floor? Would I be someone who's singing to the record albums in the early 60s? Would I be in the poetry circle? Would I be on the side, like, doing sketches and making art? Would I be uh, trying on all the different clothes? What would I be doing? Who would I be? Who would I be talking to? It's an interesting thing to think about what you might like. Uh, so I enjoyed doing that. Um, thinking about what could I do to 
write this as a place that anybody would want to go to and enjoy themselves at. So um, originally the idea for the social club actually came from a completely unrelated source, which was uh, I had kept for many years a portfolio of ideas because I originally went to film school. And when I was in film school, there was the necessity of producing different films on a pretty rapid fire cycle. We had to make like five short films per semester. So constantly had to be thinking of new ideas. And so I kept this book where I would write down ideas. For years, I held on to this book. and even if it wasn't just for film, for writing short stories. And when I was ready to write a novel, I turned back to this book of ideas and I came upon this line that I had written. It was just three words, late night barbershop. And I was looking at late night barbershop and I remembered a family member had told me about going to a late night barbershop in Brooklyn and I thought that was such an interesting idea, a late night barbershop that's so unexpected. And I sort of imagined it as turning into some kind of social club in a way that men go to this late night barbershop and talking about the neighborhood and what's going on and become friendly with the barber. And it's like a whole scene that's very unexpected in the middle of a commercial area of Brooklyn that would otherwise just be very slow for the night. You could picture that if you look down at the building, that it's the only light in a long row of stores. If you picture darkness just surrounding it, but that maybe these men would have been walking there to get their hair cut, but it's more than a haircut, right? It's an experience. And so I Looking back at this entry that I had written in my ideas book, I thought, how can I transform this into a place that's for women? And because of, as I was talking about my interest in the juncture between the wilder, crazier late 60s and the more staid 50s, I wanted to place it in that period of time. And so I decided to put the social club into that setting and that's where the idea for my book was born because of um, those two different kinds of influences so i would love to take anybody's questions you can feel free to ask me anything you want i know sometimes in audiences i have people who are interested in writing a book for the first time. You could definitely feel free to ask me any questions about that as well, in addition to questions about just the book itself. So feel free. So as we wait for everyone to write in their questions, um, one question I have because it's based in um, a different time period is uh, what, uh, if any type of research did you do to get a sense of this, um, this time setting that you put your story in? So this was based off of a combination of me talking to relatives who were enjoying this time period. And also I did a lot of visual research that directly inspired the characters. So I know in the past I've had questions about how do you come up with these characters? And actually at one point in social media, I made a post of my Pinterest board that I use. So I found pictures of people from the era who were embodying these fashions. And I, I looked at them and I was like, oh, what type of person would this be? And so I, I built up actually the uh, some of the main characters, actually all of the main characters, through these images of these random people I found. And the stories came from there. So I found you know, this image of this couple that I started sort of expanding into Elaine and Tommy. And 
um, once I knew, okay, I said, oh, that woman, I think that she wants to be a journalist. And then I started researching newspapers of the time period. And I'm like, oh, he looks like he was maybe an engineer. And then I was researching about radio engineering. So it sort of spiraled out from just seeing people in the, this, uh, they were, I mean, wearing amazing early 1960s fashions and just expanding, expanding from there. And so every detail came off of there. Um, so a lot of visual research too, in terms of the setting. So in addition to the book taking place, as I said, in Brooklyn Heights, there's also John's to Manhattan. And I've lived in both Brooklyn and Manhattan. And um, so that, I, but it's it still, I wasn't living during that time period. So I had to go and take back and go and look at photos from that time period. And then I also wrote about some other countries because Lisa takes short trips as a flight attendant and has stopovers in different places. So again, a lot of visual research to see what streets in these different cities might have looked like around the world. So uh, really, because I was basing everything off of these images, basing it off that. And of course, there were also the newsworthy events happening in the background. So this book is not about one specific news event, but to create a texture that would convey the historical experience, I made a timeline of what would have been happening on those particular days. And so on my timeline, which in the book, in the final version, I don't have the, the exact days, but my outline included the exact days. What was the weather like on that day? I went to that extensive research. And so you know, on days when it's snowing, it's because on that day in history, it was snowing in my original draft. And so, and what was happening in history and trying to weave together the tensions of these events with the tensions in the women's lives. So that That's was great. Thank you um, for that. So yeah. we did get a couple of questions um, as you were explaining that. Our first one is from Doris and their question was, how do women get invited to join this club? So, the women are invited by Madeline and Doris. Thank you so much for asking me that. So that was actually one of the entry scenes to Elaine. And so behind the scenes author talking point is that I had so many drafts going on of this book. I don't know, hundreds of drafts. Oh my gosh. So one of the deleted scenes actually found its way into the final draft and I was so happy that I saved it. But <laughs> one of the deleted scenes that ended up back in the book, if you read it, is where Madeline invites Elaine to join the club. And so uh, she, Elaine comes in as a customer and this was actually early in her relationship with Tommy and she's looking for a beautiful dress for her night on the town with Tommy. And uh, that at, this was at the sort of beginning of the social club when Madeline was starting it. And she noticed that Elaine wrote poetry and she said, oh, we'd like to have some poetry at our club and would you like to join us? And Elaine, that's how she found her way into the club. And so it's word of mouth. So women might invite their friends Madeline certainly invites people, and it's a tight-knit group. Even though it's a large group, they all kind of know each other. So it's not an official invitation in the mail, but it's more of like, we're, we're together. You know, we're going to come, and if, they, if the ladies bring a friend, that's okay. You know, that kind of thing. So that's how they get invited. Awesome. So we next, uh, we had a very good question from Judy. She would like to congratulate you on your first published novel. And then is this the first one that you wrote? This is my first published novel. Yes, I've had other writings that I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 
you know, uh, I've, I've found out through being a debut author that a lot of writers have things in their drawer that they've worked on, but this is the first extended piece of writing that I've had published. So yes, and I'm actually, I've decided that my area of interest relates to the 20th century specifically. It's one of my fascinations in terms of there being all of these decades that have such distinct personalities. So I would love to write each of my books in a different decade or in a juncture between the decades and explore some of the changes taking place for women. So working on something right now about the 20s, but I, um, so yeah, so I'm very interested in writing about the historical experiences of women in the 20th century, not through a specific historical events. That's not my area of interest in writing about a specific one historical event that the whole book is about, but rather weaving lives of some, quote, everyday women, which nobody is everyday, right? I don't <laughs> think anybody is every, everybody is a unique person. So experiencing the lives of a woman who might have gone a little bit under the radar, but maybe not for long. Oh, so that's sort of my thing. That's what I want to explore in my writing. So um, for the foreseeable future, uh, I'd like to continue writing in that vein. So um, that actually even ties into our next question from Tina is, are the women from different walks of life? Yes. So they're all from different, I wanted to make them from slightly different generations and have there be a little bit of a generation gap, but not too much. And then also that they're from different socioeconomic parts of the spectrum. So we have Lisa who comes from a family that does not have much money and she actually helps to support her parents through some of her income and her apartment is falling apart. And But then we have Elaine who was raised in more money and who her fiance has some money. And so I wanted to create in the Starlight Social Club a place that could smash down all those boundaries, just smash them. So it doesn't matter what money you have, what money you don't, you just walk in the door and you're you. So that's what I wanted to do with the club. Um, and that was another sort of fabulous part of writing it for me is like, how could this happen where, because status is such a thing, even now, right? Even now, how often do you find a place where there's people from all walks of life? Well, now we, you know, now we're all just in our homes. Hopefully that's where we should be right now. But, <laughs> you know, in 2021, <laughs> but, you know, 2019, 2018, Back in the day, did we find places where the, everybody's just together without regard of status? I, I haven't found a place like that. I don't know. Maybe somebody has. But to imagine a place like that in the early 60s, even more amazing, right? I don't, you know, I, it's something for humanity to work toward, right? So that's what I wanted to make, something for humanity to work toward. A place where you just smash the boundaries. That's great. Let go. Uh, Judy's comments was that she did grow up in the 60s and she found the concept of an underground social club interesting. It sounds like more fun than some of the group meetings she went to. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, another question that we had is, uh, are any of the three main protagonists based on um, a real life person in your life? No, they're not. And uh, really when I was talking about that Pinterest board I made, it's this very sort of visual way that I think and have thought since I was originally a film student, which is building characters from the ground. Mm -hmm. And so I really just tried to make these people come to life from how I saw them, which was separate than me, because that's something I'm just interested in 
learning really about what it's like to be other people that aren't myself and what it's like to be other people in these periods of time, some of which I haven't lived in, like, for example, this book, I haven't lived in this period of time. And I wanted to, I wanted to also pay homage to women who had to struggle, still have to struggle. And so in a way, each character symbolizes a different part of the struggle, really. And I think when I'm writing characters, I tend to think pretty symbolically in terms of what are they representing in terms of their specific personal and professional struggles of something that women have to deal with at large in society during that period of time. So, for example, Lisa as a flight attendant, the idea of women who have seemingly glamorous professions who might struggle more than we realize. And that's just, that's a particular idea that I find very fascinating and plan to continue to explore in different ways through my writing is these women who other people from the outside might look at and say, oh, I want to be her. She has it so easy or, or look at all this attention or look at how people are admiring her, but really how difficult it is uh, in the background and that there's struggles that other people might not be aware of. So that, for example, that's how I developed Lisa based off that idea. Um, and then for, uh, for Madeline, who is another character who was glossy on the outside, right? She's very vivacious, very outgoing, and nobody would expect her secret struggle. And she was really based off of my fascination and interest with what it's like to be women in the spotlight who are pictured only as silent women on news footage, right? Who we still see now. Like we never see the wives of politicians talking. It's always just them by the sides of politicians. Um, and so I was always interested in like, what's it like for these wives? And, and so I wanted to write Madeline as someone who was personifying someone who had to deal with the limelight again in a different way and wondering what that would have been like for her. And again, it's a lifestyle that a lot of people might see or envy or think is easy and is really not. So um, that's where I developed those two characters. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, your story seemed to be very women-focused. Um, so I, I was wondering who or um, who do you aspire to some of your favorite female authors? I have so many and I'm, it's hard to know where to begin, but I love Leanne Moriarty. I mean, I just love her. She's brilliant and a genius. And I don't know how she, she does amazing things with her writing in terms of both being hilarious, being dark, being deep at the same time. And so I, she's one of my favorite authors. I love Anita Diamonds. I love, um, there's, I mean, there's so many, but I, I tend to read a variety of fiction and nonfiction. I'd say I read probably 50-50 fiction, nonfiction. So it's something that I feel like I need to do in order to keep writing like sharp historical fiction is to get the nonfiction piece in there. And I also read a lot of nonfiction that is about current issues too, to think about how can I connect some of our current issues to some of our historical issues and what's a through line and how can I make it relate? So it's, it's really a blend. Uh, we did get one more question from Doris. Having studied film, do you think this book could be a film and how did your training influence your writing style? I would love for this to be a film. That would be my dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So if, or a miniseries, 
maybe even a teleplay, whatever, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I, how did my training influence my writing style? So I was originally trained to write screenplays, which is a craft of making scenes. And so it's scene, 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 keep progressing through the scenes. And when I draft, before I draft, I actually create scene cards, which are almost like, not quite like storyboarding for film, but almost like text-based storyboarding. And I have a scene card with the characters sort of like delineated on one side and the plot point on the other, and I put them all together. So, and in, in terms of my actual writing, as I'm writing it, I'm picturing with my mind's eye, like I'm a camera swooping in, swooping in. And that's actually how I spent a lot of my childhood because I, during my childhood, went between wanting to write books and write movies. And during the period when I was more cinema centric, I kept thinking of things in terms of how I would film them. Like I would walk into an unfamiliar space and oh, what kind of camera angle would I get? Or how would I focus on that? And then uh, in film school, I was also trained to observe the people around me and try to extrapolate from that, which was fun. I went to NYU, living in the city, and you just walk around, you go to the park or a coffee shop, and you come up with scenes from there. That was an exercise in film school. The professor had you, you know, go there, go by some people, try to write a scene <laughs> based off that, based off that alone, just, just those little clues you get in your environment. So um, a lot, of, which on a side note, a lot of writers have been, it's been a difficult time for writers, right? It's been a difficult time for everybody. Writers sometimes use their environment as inspiration, right? So writers have had to be extra creative during this period of time. And where do you get inspiration when there's nobody around, right? Read even more books. Just keep reading, right? <laughs> Extrapolate from that. Watch some films, you know, listen to some music. It's really, it's a true test of creativity right now. Like, where do you get creativity of your, in your four walls? You have to really let your mind do what it can. Sometimes it goes a little bit slower. It goes a little bit slower. <laughs> it's in there. It's in there. It's not the same, but it's in there. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for asking that. It's a really good question. Um, and sort of tangent of that, uh, having gone to school for film, did wanting to write a novel come later in life or was that always sort of in the background? On and off. So I actually, I wrote uh, a novel that will forever be unpublished at the age of eight. <laughs> My first chapter book, I was sitting at the table. I was like, I'm just going to keep on writing. And I remember so I was like, hey, here's a chapter. Here's a chap. Here's another chapter. It's a book, mom. Look at my book. <laughs> so I can remember that thrill of if I keep writing enough, it turns into a book. And so that was at age eight. You know, then, then there was the idea of film, right? Because uh, I wanted to reach a wide audience through film. And, and I, but I still, I minored in English. The books were still there. The books never left. But then I was working in the industry, so I was working in a talent agency for a while as a floating assistant. It was one of the major talent agencies in New York City, and I was being put into different departments because they would assign you. You didn't necessarily pick in which department you were in, so I was put in um, film for a little bit, but then moved into literary and it was in the literary department that I was, I was an assistant to the agent for international rights. So she sold the rights for books to be in translation. And so what I would get to do is see all of the English books written in English uh, come to me from overseas in all different languages. And I would unpack the boxes that came from overseas and see them translated and send them to authors. So it's a lot of fun. And I got also to see the synopses of different, a whole bunch of different books. I mean, hundreds of different books. And I'd read these and I 
just kept thinking, gosh, I really want to write one of my own one day, one day. But that was about 15, 14 years ago. I don't know, losing track time, but it was a while ago. So that was my first job out of college. And so during that period of time when I thought to myself, I really want to be a writer, you know, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't my time yet. So I, I mean, I'm, I, I, at the time I decided I wanted to go into teaching and I joined the New York City Teaching Fellows after that. I got my grad degree. I became a special ed teacher and I was working in the city as a special ed teacher. And then I moved to Pennsylvania. I was working there as a special ed teacher and that job requires immense amounts of creativity, energy, and I really was not writing too much during that period. I was still reading, always reading, always in book clubs, but in terms of creative output, it was more difficult. It requires so much as a full-time special ed teacher. So, um, but then I had my son and I became a stay-at-home mom. And it was actually when he was a newborn that I started writing in earnest again during his naps. So not right when he was born, there wasn't the energy for that, but a little bit later when he was sleeping a little more and he was taking some naps. And during that time period, I was like, let me try writing a book. Let's see what happens. So um, that's really when it started up again. And I was doing a lot more reading during that time too. At that time, uh, I was trying to stay awake in the middle of the night. You know, we have to wake up every hour or so. And I got a Kindle, uh, which was to partially to help me stay awake because I, I needed something that I could stare at where the light was really bright where I'm like, and then I just started reading. I'm like, oh my gosh, why haven't I been reading as much? And I just kept reading and reading and reading. I'm like, why haven't I been writing? Let me start writing. And then it happened uh, during nap time. And I was, um, I went back to work when he was in preschool and I was still, I mean, I was working on this book during that period of time. And then after that, um, I started becoming a freelance writer. I was, no, I, I switched to that. That was another thing. Um, but yeah, so it was a long, it was a long road. It was a long road. Great. And then before we head out, we have one last question. And you had mentioned it briefly that you are working on your next novel. Very slowly, <laughs> very slowly, <laughs> drip by drip by drop. But you know, it's, it's allowing me to really get into the time period too. And for that, I'm grateful. So it's, I have a lot to do right now because I'm, I'm teaching online in the mornings, actually very early morning. I wake up and teach online kids overseas and I'm homeschooling my son for the first time this year, full-time homeschooling. He's not in remote school, um, which is okay because I'm a certified teacher. And so that part is fine, but I, I'm sometimes writing when he's writing during his writing time. That's some of the time when I'm writing, other times when I can, when I can sort of do it. So not a full-time writer as of now, maybe years down the line I will be, but I do still hope to hopefully put out a book before too long, even if it's not going to be same day, you know, <laughs> I'm not on that schedule where I'm able to do that, but I'm really looking forward to making progress on this piece right now. Great. Well, I can't wait to get your book in my hands. It sounds super interesting yeah. and right up my alley. And I want to thank you on behalf of the library and all of our participants tonight for joining us, taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us this evening. It was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, and so I want to also thank everyone for attending and uh, everyone be safe, be well and uh, good luck in 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Bye everyone.